IoT, powering the digital economy. Brought to you by Schneider Electric. In this rapidly evolving global economy, knowledge is perhaps the most valuable currency of all. Education is the passport to our future. It equips us with the power to better our lives and transform the world around us. No surprise then that according to the World Bank Group, we spend on average over 4.7% of global GDP on schools, universities, teaching and training. And education is evolving like never before. A rising tide of digital innovation in the sector is revolutionizing the way we learn and the way we think about learning. Education is now more personalized, accessible and profitable than ever. The market for learning platforms alone is a multi-billion dollar industry, attracting serious attention from startups and existing companies alike. In 2017, global investment in learning technology companies reached over nine and a half billion dollars. In this program, we're looking at how the big players in education are keeping pace with the digital revolution and in the process, helping change the way we learn. And what about the new companies born into this brave new world? What technical innovations are they offering to help education thrive? I'll also be talking to an expert in edtech to find out how education is evolving in the digital landscape and asking how we'll teach the teachers of the future. Educational technology, or edtech as it's known, is breaking new ground in approaches to education. From cloud-based tuition to augmented reality, edtech is empowering students and teachers across the globe, with new online tools and platforms helping us all meet the shifting demands of the digital age. Around the world, the race is on to digitize learning, and edtech is a huge growing market. According to organization EdTech's X Global, only about 2% of education is currently digitized, and yet the market is three times the size of the media industry. Pearson PLC is a British-owned education and publishing service originally founded in the 1840s. In response to the growing edtech market, Pearson has moved away from traditional publishing and invested heavily in the digital realm to become a dominant force in online learning in over 70 countries worldwide. And after a turbulent year for the business in 2017, Pearson predicts their profits in 2018 to exceed $750 million. Albert Hitchcock is Pearson Education's Chief Technology and Information Officer and a member of the executive team. Prior to joining the company, he was Chief Information Officer for Vodafone and held leadership roles at BAE Industries and Nortel Networks, among others. Pearson is a well-known traditional education brand. Yes, we've seen you forge ahead uh, with EdTech. So what is it about this space that excites you? I think digital, the digital medium gives us the opportunity to really take the education and learning experience to the next level. The technology ultimately will allow us to truly personalise the education experience in a way that both improves learning outcomes, shortens le the learning time and the ability to deliver learning any, at any time, any place around the world. There's been a lot of excitement around your global learning platform, mm. so I'd like to know more about it and how it works. Yeah, I mean the vision, the vision behind the global learning platform is to basically create a model that a lot of the other digital native companies have already employed. You know, we're all familiar every day with the use of Amazon for retail as an example, Netflix for TV and movies, Spotify for music. Those companies have sort of transformed their sector. The opportunity for us is to create that, that global platform that will deliver all of our courseware and experiences around the world and to take that learning experience to the next level. So at the core of the platform, we're plugging in machine learning and artificial intelligence. It's a complete multi-device agnostic platform, so we can deliver content to any device anywhere in the world. Um, and it's also going to allow us to personalize the experience to the student, but also give the institution and the, and the, the teaching faculty 
access to how the student is responding to that experience. What about cross-sector partnerships? Does uh, EdTech make it easier? Well, I think one of the things that EdTech does do is it enables us to really focus on things like employability, as an example. I mean, we know from employers that 40% of students come out of university without the requisite skills needed for each of the sectors. And so I think one of the big opportunities is to work with companies to really sort of help shape education. Here in London, we have something called Pearson College, where we're actually teaching degree level courses, working alongside employers. So as an example, a Unilever could work with us to design a, a degree level course that would you know, serve their needs as an employer. Um, and so I think there's a very tight collaboration here between particular higher education and the professions and the companies to help to sort of inform the next generation of, of learning. As online learning continues to grow, so does the need for schools to manage their teaching over the cloud. Firefly Learning is one company that's been lighting up the sector by offering schools an intuitive, groundbreaking platform that brings students, teachers and parents closer together. In 2016, Firefly secured the largest Series A funding for an edtech company in the UK with an investment of six and a quarter million dollars. Simon Hay is a founding partner at Firefly. While still at school, he and his classmate, Joe Mathewson, developed an online system to help their teachers and fellow students access school information in and out of the classroom. And in just a few years, the company has gone from strength to strength with teams in the UK, Singapore and Australia. So for a teacher, we're really trying to save them uh, time that they can spend on teaching rather than on, on admin. They can set work, students can hand that in online. So I could uh, look at the essay and uh, annotate that uh, and give feedback. And I can also do that in new ways. So for example, I might uh, give voice feedback. Excellent essay overall, David, really well done. Just a couple of points. And what about the students? What do they see? We have a separate app for students, which is an electronic equivalent of their paper homework diary. Mm. So this helps them organize their day at school in the same way they organise the rest of their lives on their phones. What we've been trying to do is to make it easy for teachers who aren't IT experts and don't really want to be to create and curate and share resources and set and collect and mark work, um, track their students' progress and engage parents more in the kind of day-to-day -day learning conversations that are going on. Where is this being used at the moment? So we're still quite small but we're growing fast so we're used by um, a few million people now uh, around the world, so uh, a lot of the UK, um, but also 35 other countries, all the way from, from here to Australia and, and a lot of places in between. What makes the platform special though? Because um, there are a lot of you know, platforms like this, learning platforms uh, of this sort. Yeah, and I think it's a really confusing marketplace for schools actually, because I think there's a lot of overlapping um, products and it's really unclear to people whether these two things compete or integrate. People can talk about feature lists till the cows come home, but I think that probably what sets us apart more is philosophy. So we've tried really, really hard to be focused. We think the way that we make schools happy is by doing a small set of things, and we hope being the best in the world at those, and then playing nicely with others at the edges of that. So we focused kind of uh, fanatically on, on the ease of use and the quality of the user experience, because I think unless you get that right and you build something that is uh, usable by every teacher and every member of the school community, not just the enthusiasts or the experts, then you're never going to get the uptake that you need to actually have any impact. And ultimately, that's why we're here, right? We want to make a difference to students' experiences at school and ultimately to their learning outcomes. Yet it's still a rather competitive field, edtech. So how do you sort of, you know, survive given all the competition that's coming up or competition that exists? So I think you need to keep moving. Um, you know, edtech is at the intersection of education and technology, and both of those are actually um, really fast-moving fields. Um, and it means that we have to stay on our, on our toes. I think that functionality that even a few years ago was uh, very difficult to produce and, and valuable gets quickly commoditized, and there are now all sorts of things um, that, that can be done for free that um, a little while ago people would have paid good money for, and that means that companies like ours need to be continually moving up the, the value chain and making sure that we're doing more and more of the things that schools get excited by as they see the kind of unfolding potential that, that these technical advances bring them.
The cornerstone of the EdTech value chain is of course the system infrastructure. As cloud-based learning expands, then we need reliable systems to make sure the flow of information to electronic devices is fast and reliable. For the two billion people in the world living without a reliable source of electricity, projects like this one in Lagos, Nigeria can make a huge difference. Lagos State Power Company are working in conjunction with Schneider Electric and Microsoft's cloud computing service Azure to create and manage solar power for over 200 local schools. The system connects across the internet where it can be remotely monitored and maintained to ensure thousands of students can go about their studies uninterrupted. They're also able to charge devices and personal night lights for at home study so learning can continue into the evening. By 2020, the partnership will help an estimated 190,000 pupils gain access to educational tools. EdTech is opening new frontiers in the business of teaching, and it's also fundamentally changing our ideas on how we deliver education. So what does this mean for students and their educators? And do we need a new set of rules to help govern this digital flow of information? After the break, I'll be speaking to an expert in the sector on concerns around the classroom of the future. Education is in the grip of a digital revolution. New technologies and methods of teaching online are forcing us to reappraise the way we learn. But these exciting developments in EdTech bring with them a range of concerns for parents, educators and their students. I've come to University College London's Knowledge Lab, where a team of academics are exploring new ideas and approaches to education and technology. Hello, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Like Professor you? Rose Luckin has been developing and writing about the learning sciences, ed tech and artificial intelligence for over 20 years. She's also an international advisor on digital futures and the design and use of ed tech. Let's talk about business-to-business uh, -business collaborations in the sector. What standards are in place and what standards need to be in place to make these work better? That's very interesting. I mean, my concern about the lack of standards and the, the, the lack of ways of working um, for people like myself working in a university and businesses outside were the, the, the jumping off point for forming the Educate project, which brings those communities together. Because there wasn't really a, a set way for people to collaborate together. And actually, unlike the health sector, where there's a long tradition of different collaborations, the, the ed tech ecosystem, so to speak, is still forming. On one side, you have ed tech, which is a very corporate world, where there is the small entrepreneurs or the larger uh, companies. And then on the other side, uh, you have the educators. And in some cases, those are you know, state education projects. How do we kind of make those two work together? Um, it's different in different countries because there are some intermediaries that try and broker relationships um, between educators and companies, and that's different across the globe. But in general, the relationship is challenging because the company is obviously trying to make a profit and the educator is wanting to teach mm. or to learn. And it's about trying to find ways of bringing those two agendas together in a way that line up. Now, a lot of ed tech uh, platforms are global platforms, uh, and that brings in itself a new challenge uh, when it comes to regulation. How do we maintain standards? Different parts of the world will have different regulations. And certainly, these new EU regulations stipulate what happens within EU member countries. But I think there are not just the regulations that may be enforced in that particular part of the world, but there are also the ethical implications on these companies, particularly those who are working with young people or possibly vulnerable adults too, to be very upfront about exactly what happens to their data, how it's stored, how it's processed, how it's kept private and secure. And I think one of the most important things in this area is actually educating people to understand what's likely to be happening to their data and what questions to ask. I mean, clearly we're very conscious of things like data privacy and security. And we have a very mature program in the company around sort of GDPR and everything we need to do there. And, and we're very conscious that particularly for student data, 
um, we need to make sure that student data is captured in the country of origin and we comply with all the regulatory uh, requirements that governments have in this space. And so in particular, you know, our new architecture around global learning platform and everything we're doing there is built from the outset to both ensure that the data stays within the country of origin, but also that we protect access to it and things like all the sort of cyber security controls and technologies are applied to ensure that this thing is really you know, highly secure and stable um, for our business going forward. We've always had to take, uh, in particular, things like data security um, and people's personal information extremely seriously. We're dealing with sensitive information about children, um, so we have to concentrate very hard on making sure that we're good guardians of uh, the information we've been trusted with. The main thing that we have to do is to make sure that we have infrastructure in uh, all the different regions that we operate in. And that's both from a regulatory point of view to make sure that people's data is being held in the jurisdiction that uh, it needs to be, but also just from a uh, performance point of view, it gives people a much better experience if um, they're not having to access servers on the other side of the world. So it kind of makes sense from, uh, from both standpoints. So far, what we found is that the European standards are, uh, are pretty stringent. And so if we're making sure that we're uh, doing all the things from a technical and a process point of view that we need to do to comply with that, that stands us in pretty good stead around the world. For Professor Rose Luckin of UCL, another major concern is that of quality control. I keep being told there's loads of content out there, content's not a problem. Yes, there is a lot of educational content available on the web through multiple different sorts of devices. It's not all that good a quality. And it's wrong to think that we have content to meet any need that's of a good enough quality. It's getting better and we are developing the sorts of systems using artificial intelligence techniques that can select the better of the resources that are available. The technology can help to filter the content um, and do some kind of quality control automatically. And we can also use people to do that. If you think about some of the um, marketplaces, such as the TES marketplace, that's a global marketplace of resources created by teachers for teachers. Teachers pick the resources that work best, and then other teachers take notice of what the teacher who's just used that resource says about it. And that's a way of kind of using the technology to support human control. Educators and regulators need to keep a steady eye on global developments if we're to ensure the safe future growth of edtech. But the evolution of the sector is far from over. So where is edtech headed and what does this mean for businesses and learners of tomorrow? After the break, we'll be finding out about new innovations on the horizon. Education technology is big business. Global investment in edtech rose from $2.5 billion in 2014 to $9.5 billion in 2017. So where is all this investment going? And what does this mean for developments in the future? I think it's interesting. Education is one of the few industries remaining that hasn't been totally transformed by technology in the way that most others have been by now. Um, and I think that's why there's, there's huge opportunity in this space and it's why we're excited about it because I think that the change that technology can bring will have real meaningful uh, impact on, on students' future life directions. And what's largely happened so far is moving traditional pen and paper based processes online. It's great, it gives significant productivity, uh, benefits for teachers, it helps save lots of time and money, but what really gets me excited is the stuff that technology makes possible that was never even imaginable in an offline world. So how can we take advantage of this tech to change teaching practices, to give more effective formative feedback to students, to close attainment gaps, to have parents more uh, able to help their uh, children's learning. But we also want to um, enter new markets around the world because there are three quarters of a billion school students out there and the vast majority of them are still doing things exactly the same way that their ancestors were 150 years ago. We want to be able to ultimately have uh, the impact that we're having on million students on 10 million or 50 million. When you look at the future of you know, the industry, uh, you know, the ed tech space, where do you see it going? Well, I mean, I think the opportunity is huge, right? So there are 500 million students out there that are not going through formal education, right? There are people out there that are not getting access to high quality learning. 
Um, and so I think you know, this is a huge you know, positive for society if we can get it right. It's also incredibly positive for employers as well if we can equip you know, people with the skills for employability. Um, you know, we talk about efficacy a lot internally, which is how do we create an experience that truly delivers you know, an outstanding learning experience that enables people to learn faster, at higher quality, at lower cost. And I think the digital medium is the mechanism with which we can do that through. And obviously, engaging with faculty and with teachers using the digital medium, we think we can have a massive impact mm. and help students and society as a whole. One of the things I think is going to happen is technology is going to become much more invisible. Um, we're going to stop talking and thinking about it as much uh, and just start taking it for granted and relying on it um, as a implicit part of our, our daily lives. Uh, so I think that technology will blend into the background and become more of a silent enabler. Um, and actually, I think schools are a good environment for that because they are quite structured. And so the technology can have a pretty good guess about who you are and where you are and what you're doing and who you're doing it with, and therefore what might be most useful to you right now. So if you're in a physics lesson with your sixth form class, we can tell you, here are the notes that you wrote uh, last time about what you wanted to cover. Don't forget to tell Thomas well done on um, his last piece of work. Here's the uh, work they've all handed in for you. Here's the video that you were going to show them. Here's the animation that you were going to use. I think there are also opportunities for computers themselves to learn from some of that data. And we can learn how people learn, for example, and give them things that suit their approach and suit their progress and their timelines. We're very excited about artificial intelligence and machine learning because it truly gives us the opportunity to personalise the learning experience. So a good example would be the work we're doing with IBM and IBM Watson using artificial intelligence to both inform the learning process and also to create a, a cognitive tutor, as we call it, for students so that the actual uh, platform itself actually in, it interfaces with the student and the cognitive tutor is actually asking questions of the student as they go through the course. Some argue that artificial intelligence and uh, ed tech may take over you know, the classroom and take away the need for teachers. Where do you stand? Now we don't agree with that view actually. We think it's really going to enable the teaching profession because it takes a lot of the sort of administration out of the role of a teacher and the teacher can really focus on adding value to the student in terms of both helping them through the courseware and the course experience but also helping to design some of the some of the way that the, that the, that the content and the courseware is actually delivered so we actually see that this, the, that the faculty and the instructors the professors as integral to delivering that, that next generation experience. But it seems the real key to the successful teaching of the future lies in educating our educators. One of the reasons why I stress the need for educators to be part of the discussions about how technologies are developed and how they're used is because that's one very, very good way of training people. Because if they understand the intentions behind the design of a piece of technology and they are part of that process, they are naturally becoming much better at using that technology. Because in the end, it will be the human factor that makes the difference. So training the trainers, training the educators is fundamentally important. For me, it's part of the technology product and service has to be the training that goes alongside that product or service. Education is more essential than ever before to the needs of our changing global workforce. If we're to flourish in our shifting global economy of the future, then we all need accessible learning. But the key to success lies not just in edtech distributing the flow of knowledge, but in equipping the learners of today with the tools and skills that they need to be the workers and creative thinkers of tomorrow. IOT, powering the digital economy. Brought to you by Schneider Electric.